Uh, the you know, officially start the meeting. Uh, as as I was saying before, we officially started. Uh, we don't have. I don't have any like big announcements or or work related uh, things. Uh, part of what we're I've been doing is our uh, kind of. It's, it, we're coming up at the end of the federal fiscal year, as many of you know, so there are a lot of scrambling uh, that we do to get things to EPA, fulfilling our kind of obligations uh, in, under the CERCLA program, the Leaking Underground Storage Tank program, the Broker Corrective Action program, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of, uh, as you know, this time of year, a lot of broads come out kind of uh, in the summer and, you know, there are public hearings going on the, uh, in order to kind of get them done by the end of the fiscal year because there's a certain amount of bean counting uh, that goes on. You want to be able to show your accomplishments. Um, so a big one coming up is the um, remedy being proposed for the Olin chemical uh, site in Wilmington. Uh, and I believe there'll be a a uh, public meeting uh, towards the end of September to uh, to talk about that. Um, our residuals program is going to be, this is not EPA related, uh, but PFAS related. Our residuals program is going to have a public meeting uh, to talk about PFAS in uh, residuals, you know, biosolids from wastewater treatment plants, that sort of thing. Uh, that's coming up at the end of September. So a lot of things in, in, in the works, in the planning, uh, a lot of things going to be coming to fruition you know, in, in the near future, but this week, I got nothing. Um, and, and that plus the fact that I'm going on vacation next week. Uh, there are a lot of other things like mandatory training uh, due tomorrow that has to, be, has to be done. So if you hear some training thing going on in the background, uh, that may be me trying to get through a three-hour training by multi multitasking during office hours. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell the the training folks I said that. I uh, that's not actually happening. I'm tempted, but it's not actually happening. Um, so that's what I got. So uh, so I'm really dependent on you guys asking questions, anything that you're you're interested in, or or. Uh, uh, Anybody from DEP, uh, Liz or Peggy, I, I see that want to throw in things that you know I should have said but completely skipped my mind uh, because that happens. Um, I'll, I'll turn it up to you. Uh, and Bonnie, Bonnie Pataki had a question, so so we'll let Bonnie go first, and everybody else can can you know, frame their questions while she's talking. Yes, Bonnie. So this is on behalf of the LSPA Regulatory Committee. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks for asking, Bonnie. Anybody next? <laughs> I just thought I'd preface that. It's not my personal question. Um, okay. So the status of the MCP amendments. And I'll, I'll turn to Liz. 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 Go ahead. They're still in the works. And we're still saying we hope to have them out this fall. And that's the schedule we're working under. Okay. Uh, Liz, Liz has been diligently kind of working through the, all of that. Liz, you want to kind of talk about your process uh, <laughs> at, at all? I mean, there's a lot of paperwork and keeping track of kind of what changes we make and how and why and making sure we understand that. So. Uh, well, right now, any changes that were made from the proposed to the final are being, um, you know, highlighted. It, it's kind of hard to do red line over red line and kind of um, carry forward the changes so everyone can understand them. But um, so they're, they're being highlighted in a different color um, for, for review so that the re reviewers can um, you know, track what's changed. We're completing the response to comment document. So we've taken all the comments received and, and um, for each of those comments, we're providing a, a specific response to it, whether it led to a change or not, or um, that's, that's pretty much the process. And it, we, it has to be um, complete an internal DEP review. And then um, the secretary, 
Terry's office also reviews it. There may be a briefing in there with them uh, before it goes to ANF and it can go final. Okay. During the last set of revisions, there was training that started, um, I think even before the final was issued. So if I think about that model and training for the new regs, would you anticipate that would be the end of the year in the spring? Um, it's, it would likely be, it, you know, the beginning of next year, you know, early, early next year. Um, because we do have that lag time between the time that they're published and the time they go fully effective. And it's nice to try to put the training in that time period. Okay. That, that's one of, that's one of the, you know, reasons for having a delayed response time is it gives us the opportunity to um, provide training and develop um, Q and A's related to the reg changes and that sort of thing. Good, thank you. Yeah, and and kind of thinking about that a little bit. Uh, I mean, that's that's one of the things as we kind of finalize in our mind, not you know, even before it goes through, you know. I, I could see starting working on some of the the different topics, getting getting the slides together, and assuming that this is going to be online training <laughs> and not in person. Uh, you know, there there are things that we can do working towards that to kind of make that go a little bit faster. But uh, while it's that, through the review process, you know, that might be a question that. Um, you all would want to think about and give us some feedback on is how to structure that training. Mm, okay. I'm assuming that people don't want to sit for four straight hours so we could maybe create modules and, and roll some out sooner than others. Yeah. Mm, that's an interesting um, thought. Uh, Liz, can I respond to that request? So there was some discussion in the regulatory committee um, and it, I guess it was um, I, I think there's a consensus of four hours of training would be <clears throat> a bit long and how much <laughs> would be retained um, and whether we could do increments of two hours of and then have um, it could be a, like a four hour training, but you have to attend on different days. Mm -hmm. um, so you would register for the training, have two hours, and then you'd be giving the next set of days and then there would be some sort of, um, you know, uh, review. Um, I don't know if that's something, if DEP has done other um, trainings like that within other agencies, um, so not necessarily the Bureau of Waste Site Cleanup. Um, I'm not sure I followed the, the, the two and the two in the review, but I think we're flexible as to how to put it together in a way that makes sense and people would find it, you know, most easy to take in all the information. I, I, mean, I could see, I mean, I mean, for us, the, the, the work involved in putting together the slides for, say, for our four-hour training, uh, you know, that's the same amount of work, regardless of how we then cut it up and actually present right. it. And, and you know, right now, if we're doing this uh, over, you know, online, uh, it's it's probably it's easier on us as well. You know, it, if you think it's hard sitting through the four hours of training, yeah. it's also hard giving four hours of training. It is. Yeah. So, so doing it, you know, it's four hours. You know, doing it, you know, one hour a week for four four weeks actually would be a lot easier to do than. Yeah, okay. One big block. Okay. And then in the end, you know, then we have it all recorded and all of that, and it becomes an on-demand course that everybody else can see. Um, and and that could be structured so people could do it in segments uh, as well. Right. I could even see you register for, you know, all four units or however many units. And then you have the option of taking it live or or taking the recorded session. And I think that was the thought when the committee was, you know, you could be there for, you know, some of the live sections when you could, right. and then, yeah, here later. Um, and so it gave some flexibility. Yeah. Um, 
So, but you've registered for all, you know, four or two. So. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like the idea of doing like four one hour courses. <laughs> uh, but, okay. Or two two hour courses, you know, however. You know, okay. We, we, can, we can play around with that. Okay. Uh, we're certainly open for it. Great, thank okay. you. Okay, that was an easy one. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> How about how about a harder question? No, okay. Like I said, we 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 could go through through this uh, quickly, um, and and call it into the official portion of the meeting. If if nobody else has anything, uh, they want to talk about. Or I have a question. Yes, Elliot. And it was a follow-up to the um, LSPA DP training yesterday on AUL audits and lessons learned. And it has to do with the sketch plan that goes with an AUL. And I think I know the answer, but the question keeps coming to me from uh, our group discussions. And so if you have a building, and it relates to what has to be surveyed relative to the limits of an AUL. And I know the limits of the AUL need to be surveyed, whether it's a property or a piece of a property, but if you have a barrier, like under a building, um, there's been some discussion as whether the limits of the barrier need to be surveyed or the, the limits of paved areas versus landscape areas. And my interpretation is no, they just need to be shown accurately on the sketch plan. So can you either confirm or deny my interpretation? Um, I, I, I don't wanna say this as, as definitive, but my understanding is the same as yours. But Peggy, Peg, I saw Peggy was on here. Peggy, is, is that? how you recall it described? I'm actually trying to pull up our latest draft because we went back and forth on this, but that's my understanding um, of what our current thinking is on that or what our, what our policy is on that. Um, Did, was there, what was, the, um, what was the discussion in the training? Something different than that? Um, no, just the sketch. The, it just said that if you look at the draft, the 2014 draft policy, it says that the sketch plan needs to show barriers, you know, areas of landscaping, areas of pavement, because if it's referenced in the language of the AUL, you need to be able to go look and see where are those areas to go out to the site. Right. But there's been some folks that thought that meant it had to be surveyed. Elliot, I thought that the survey was required only if the restrictions under the different types of barriers are different. Exactly. That sounds familiar. Yeah. That, that, we, we did have that, that, that was what we were saying and I, and I, I thought we backtracked on that a little bit and I'm just, I'm, I'm trying, I can't, I can't find the latest document. Um, Could you explain what, what that distinction? I don't know if I follow that. Well, let, let's say the barrier is only under the building and doesn't extend to the property line. Don't you have to define that building, those building corners in space? It'd be different if the barrier went into, under the entire property and the AUL applied to the entire property. Mm -hmm. What if it only applies to a subset of, of the entire I don't, property? I don't think so. Because if it was shown accurately on the sketch plan, here's the building. And it's under the building. I don't, I don't see a need to survey the corners of the building. So, I, I also think there is something, and and I can't um, speak to what it exactly it says, but I think there is a a reg change related to this as well. So, I think I think I'd feel more comfortable. Gee, that was a hard question. <laughs> it's a hard. I feel. I just. I don't. I don't know the know what um what we have as off the top of my head what we have as the current interpretation of that but when um someone someone mentioned that where there's differences in terms of the level of restriction in the areas that um they should be surveyed that does sound familiar to me but 
I think the best thing for us to do is to go back and um, you know, get you get you a firmer answer to the question. Yes, yes. section four point three point six of the two thousand fourteen guidance. So is is I'm going to ask an uninformed question, but is there a difference in what we would expect if the in one case the AUL applies to the entire property? Uh, versus if the AUL is going to be limited to just one portion of the property? I don't think so. I think this, well, the sketch plan further defines areas within the area that's already restricted, whether, it, yeah. whether restriction applies to the entire property or to an AUL area within the property boundaries. But Liz, uh, we need a uh, meets and bounds description, though, of the AUL area. And right. if it's a subset of the property, if it's smaller than the property, isn't the only way to get that meets and bounds description through a survey? Right, but that's, that's the overall boundary of the AUL area. That's the AUL. The AUL area needs a survey, but the sketch plan is, my understanding, is, is within that area, it's yes. defining features within that area. I, I just found, I found the latest version that we worked on and because we went back and forth on this issue based on a lot of different um, interpretations and comments um, and we backed off from requiring a survey on for barriers. So when you're just delineating the barrier, not the AUL area, but just a barrier, um, that can be done in a sketch plan. Okay. So if you had a, if the AOL, for example, specified landscape areas need three feet of clean soil and paved areas need pavement plus sublease plus whatever, but it's different between pavement and landscaping. Those would show on an engineered plan on the sketch plan, but I, you know, I don't see a need. I don't think it's required that I survey all my landscape islands. Right. And, and what we've said in the guidance um, is we're trying to be more clear on what needs to go into that sketch plan because we need to be able, when we see that sketch plan, we want to be able to know when we go to the property exactly where these different areas are. And, and the AUL needs to be written, you know, to, um, um, you know, to work with that scenario. So, you know, the survey plan, you can tell exactly what the difference is. But um, the, it, it, the sketch plan just needs to have enough information. But you don't have to do anymore. We don't, we're not requiring a survey plan for the barrier. I, I, I guess to, to be a monkey wrench, um, so my question is like, does it really, how, you know, how much does it really matter? Like in, in Elliot's example, if you have a sketch plan that shows landscape area and a paved area and your AUL says all landscape areas have to have, you know, this profile and all paved areas have to have this profile. If the property owner wants to, you know, reclaim some parking lot to have it be more green and plant, so long as he complies with the AUL, does it really matter where that boundary is? Well, it really depends on how the AUL is written. If the if the terms are the same for both areas, then you probably don't have to make a distinction. It's really going to depend on what the AUL says. But if you have very different requirements for two different areas, then it probably should be defined. Yeah, I think I in in past yeah. discussions we've we've talked about if. If Marilyn, in your example, where people want flexibility over time, then they should they should uh, write less spe specificity into the AULs. They could describe the areas. They may be landscape paved, but they all you know in all of those areas, this this is what would apply. So it retroactively, it's kind of hard when someone's written a very specific AUL, but. Um, you know, going forward, if you could see that area changing over time, uh, one way to handle it is to um, not be as specific in terms of what could be in that area as far as the, the covering on the surface. Makes sense. Um, relative to the amount of information for a barrier. So you have like a, 
the liquid boot covers the whole footprint of the building. And beneath that is a layer of crushed stone with some network of piping for the, say, passive SSDS that leads up to the roof. Would you show that piping layout in the sketch plan or just the footprint of the area? Um, I think the, I actually, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question in terms of. That's um, two hard questions. <laughs> that's, but I do think the reg change um, gets into that a bit. Okay. It, it talks about, um, you know, details in as far as what's in that area. Okay. So it, I don't, I think it's kind of um, general language, but uh I, I do think from our perspective, that kind of detail is helpful. Uh, the downside of that detail is what we just talked about it in terms of um, should there be changes, how much of a change would make that information now not, not right and, yeah. and require some updating. So, but providing the detail in terms of somebody using that area and knowing what's there and it being helpful for locating things, I, I think that's the overall goal of it. Um, so, you know, there's judgment involved in that. Yeah. I'm just thinking because that information is in the in the MCP documents, you know, that support the permanent solution and the AUL. Right. Yeah, that's another kind of conversation we've had about um, how much goes into the AUL versus referencing back to the, the permit solution statement. Okay, so that, so look forward to the revised regs for an answer. Well, the revised regs will give sort of the outline and I think um, the guidance updates would put more detail in that, but there was there was a provision related to what should go in the sketch plan. Is that for early release? <laughs> um, it, it's out, you can go look at the draft. We did get some comments on that. Um, the comments were sort of along the lines of this discussion. So I don't know if I could release the final language to you because it hasn't um, gone through review. Okay. But um, but you're talking about the policy now, not the MCP. I'm, I'm saying there's MCP amendments also related to the sketch plan. Okay, if, okay. If Got memory it. is serving me. Um, if you're interested, Elliot, I'll go back, take a look, and, and, um, and uh, I can point out what it is. Currently. I have a project where we're updating the AUL and the sketch plan in particular, so it would be helpful to know what what I should be putting in it. So would it would it be something we could do uh, to say that in two weeks when we have an, a, this meeting again, uh, maybe we could have a little bit more definitive sure. sort of description about where we're That's going. Fine. Thank you. That sounds good. And and maybe some like drawings of. <laughs> I was I was sitting here trying to like draw my understanding of this in PowerPoint and um and I'm not going to share it because I'm sure it's wrong. But uh but it might be help you know I would like to it would be helpful for me to see it visually that you know here's the limits of the AUL, here's one example of kind of what could be in a sketch plan. You know, just very simple what would need to be surveyed, what wouldn't be need, wouldn't need a survey. Okay, think about that'd be, it. That'd be great. Um, well, just, just one more comment. The only thing that needs to be surveyed, you need a survey of the property boundaries, you need a survey of the AUL area. Everything else can go in a sketch plan in general. That's the easy answer. So, so if the barrier is not the entire AUL area, it's only a part of it, that barrier, the boundaries of the barrier do not need to be delineated in a survey. It can go into a sketch plan, but the boundary of the AUL area has to be surveyed. Right, so, so you can, mini let, let, let me try this. You can minimize the amount of surveying if the boundary of the AUL coincides with the boundary of the property. Yes. Yeah. 
than a course you, you can do it in one survey. You you can maximize the amount of surveying <laughs> needs to be done. If you, you can survey everything if you want. Well, <laughs> if if, well, if you. you say, look, I you know, I have this big property. I only want land use restrictions on the the small areas that absolutely need it. So I have a cap over here, over there. I'll that will have an AUL, but I don't want that AUL covering anything that you know, has lesser restrictions. Yes. Yeah. So I'll have a cap of, where am I? Over here, I'll have maybe another cap or restriction over here and I'll have one over here. And if you only want the AULs applying in those very specific spots, then you have three AULs, you need to survey them. But if you want, have the AUL boundary drawn to include all those three areas, that's just a single survey. Correct. That's what prompted the discussion at the training yesterday, Paul, is that, is that you know, from the auditor's perspective, if you, if you go with the minimum amount of surveying and include the whole property, then the auditor doesn't know that only this smaller area is actually the part that has to have something maintained or whatever. And so you may be doing something in an area that wasn't necessarily the disposal site, but the auditor doesn't know that because the AUL covers the whole property. Yeah, so right. I think and that's that's. Our, oh, sorry. Oh no no. no you're, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> no, Peg, you're there. I, I was just going to say, arguably, not just the auditors, but nobody looking at the AUL knows that the terms right. of the AUL only apply to a certain. It, it's it. So we we encourage people to think about how this will work in the future if you wanted to say build a you know expand your uh, it, um put another building on your property um that isn't impacted by the terms of the AUL but you did um uh, you didn't um delineate that AUL area you applied it to the whole property then you have to go back and um and do something with that but um yeah so i mean that's that's really the issue Right. But isn't that where the, the sketch plans come into play and the, the language that's in the AUL and any references back to the permanent solution? It's, you know, say you had a very broad AUL that applied to the entire property to minimize the, the survey, then you could see situations where if the AUL is written, let's just say poorly, it could cause a lot of confusion because it would appear to be applying restrictions absolutely everywhere. And it's hard for anybody, an auditor or a prospective buyer or the construction crew to figure out what's allowed where. Yeah. But if, if the AUL is written well and the sketch plan is drawn well and the ties back to the permanent solution and other documents, then uh, I, I'll, I'll turn to Peggy and ask, are there situations or examples where all of that kind of additional, all of those materials are written well so that it minimizes any confusion, even though the AUL applies to the entire property? No, because the regs won't allow for that. The regs require the area of the AUL to be delineated in a survey plan. So if you have the AUL area applied to the entire property, then the terms in the AUL apply to the whole property. Right. But That's right. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the sketch plan says at that point. It's, it, you have to have, according to the MCP, which is consistent with real estate law. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> Suppose, um, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the MCP says that you need to delineate that area. So you, that, and, um, so you need you need a survey of the AUL area. It's been that way all along. It's yeah. always been that way. Yeah. Paul, can I ask a question? This is Barry Fogel. Hey, Barry. Hey, good morning, everybody. So in the uh, MCP, the you need an as-built construction report for an engineered barrier or cap. Does that require survey boundaries for the as-built construction report for that? And if so, why not use those? Surveyed boundaries in the AUL. Well, an engineered barrier is different than a cap. Just the cat cap or the geomembrane beneath a building. 
Yeah, I don't know how specific that is uh, to your question, but I was just in the as built construction report for an engineered barrier cap or other containment system. So I didn't know whether the as built report was supposed to have survey boundaries for that system. Where are you reading oh, from, Barry? Oh, 75. Say it again. 40.0875. I happen to have a paper copy. <laughs> <laughs> That was one of the first things I, I did was during this you know, work at home, mail a paper copy of the MCP to LIDS. And just because it's sort of engineering, shall, the as built plans shall conform to appropriate engineering and construction standards. I don't know if that the engineers in the group, if that the requires containment of plans. physical immobilization. Yeah. No. I, so I think Barry is focusing on uh, uh, eight seven five parentheses three. It should be prepared in conformance with appropriate engineering and construction standards and practices. So the question is, is it typical for you know when one is constructing a a say a landfill cap? an engineer barrier, a landfill cap, that the, the, those uh, structures are surveyed at the end of it as part of the as-builds. So it's an engineering question, not a specific MCP requirement. The, requirement. the MCP requirement is do it using best practices and according to the standards and practices of the, the trade. So if you go to section one of 875, where it talks about as built constructions. It says, as built construction report for any disposal site or engineer barrier cap or other on site system for the containment and or physical immobilization of oil and hazardous materials is constructed as part of a remedial action alternative. So I don't know that a geomembrane. The vent beneath the slab would be for containment of physical mobilization. Yeah, I, I don't think that's that's Barry's question. Let, let's forget the. As I heard in the conversation, I thought I heard the word barrier in there somewhere. Yeah, but let, let's even the, the even the most obvious case. Let's say an engineer an engineered barrier, you know, for covering uh, exceedance of UCLs. You know, yeah. the, the more extreme okay. case. If when that is built, is it part of the standard? engineering practices to survey the boundaries of those structures? No, it, it would be drawn to scale on a drawing. So, it should be to scale. I don't know that it would be surveyed. Yeah, so the, the as-built for those, for say a landfill with uh, cap is not routinely surveyed uh, in the as-built. Yeah, I just don't know. When I deal with engineers lots of times, if they're stamping a plan, they like to survey the boundaries of things shown on that plan. Not necessarily just in the MCP context, but I just mean engineers say, if I'm going to stamp it, I want to be able to. Yeah, that, that's, I'm, I'm saying that's where it is. And if it may well relate to whatever that feature is, I would think they want yeah. to document it. You know, somebody was talking in the conversation about creating new green space out of a parking lot. You want to make sure that subsequent future owners don't clip whatever barrier or containment or feature is part of that ultimately. I would say that you'd want to use a survey to confirm that the samples that you're trying to isolate have been isolated and you need to a survey to confirm that. Exactly. Okay. Well, we're 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 going down the rabbit hole that I, I think would probably be better better served to back out a little bit. And our uh, Liz and and Peggy are uh, I I think we'll have some more detail on this uh, topic in two weeks.
uh, on kind of the direction we're going and kind of what the, the we think the proposed regs, uh, the, the final regs will say and the guidance will say and how that will work and kind of uh, hopefully present it in a way that uh, will make sense to those of us who aren't uh, engineers or real estate lawyers. Uh, or surveyors. Or surveyors. Yeah. I have a scale right here. Yeah, <laughs> you have an engineering scale. <laughs> I, I have a banana somewhere. <laughs> uh, and call it pencils, so. Okay, so, so, so thank you, Elliot, for the, the, <laughs> the time-eating question. Uh, any, anything else not survey-related? <laughs> All right, talk about it. Okay. Will you be issuing bound copies of the new MCP? Bound <laughs> copies? We we don't issue bound. Not bound, but these you know the, nice. The Secretary of State does. Yes, it's a true copy. And if you're willing to pay for it, you know, I'm willing we'll to be pay. willing to send you one. Okay, good. <laughs> that's that's generally the way it works. Um, so Paul mentioned he shipped my MCP to me. And um, the I'm only problem, I haven't, had, I, I haven't had the heart to tell him that the version he grabs from my shelf is, oh, the no. one, is the one that I cannibalized to copy pieces. So every time I go to go to a key part of the MCP, it's missing. <laughs> I have all the filler parts, but I don't have any of those parts that you always need to refer to. You don't use the electronic version? I do, but this, I don't know how, I don't know how you all feel, but I find it easy to actually, you know, see the physical copy a lot of times. It's reassuring. Yeah. I've had it in the same binder since like 1995. Uh, Okay, well, Liz, when I go back in or a week from next Tuesday, uh, I'll call you and you can, and I'll have my camera. You can, you can tell me. I can show you which, exactly one, which is, one is the real. Yeah, it's not like I'm paying for the postage either. You know, <laughs> I just bring it to the hotel room. Uh, it's, it, it is very easy for me to do. Uh, I, I could, I could, you know, if you're not, if you're not careful, I'll just put everything in your bookcase in a box and mail it to you. Um, okay, uh, so like, like I, we don't have any other updates on kind of our time frame from going back. It's still, you know, we're all planning for the long term, uh, working from home and having that flexibility. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I think that's it. Uh,